When you think of Antarctica, I bet that you would imagine a desolate place, one filled with only ice and the barren ocean which would surround it. But what if I told you when we look back over 180 million years ago, it used to be an environment that hosted a number of early dinosaurs, specifically one carnival with an impressive size compared to the rest of the world. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host bringing you another case study. Today's subject of analysis will be one of, if not the largest predator to have walked Antarctica, this being Cryolophosaurus, the frozen crested reptile. As always, don't forget to like and subscribe as your support means everything. Anyways, let's waste no time in getting into how this theropod came to be. Cryolophosaurus, the first known theropod found in Antarctica, was discovered in the Cilius Sealstone of the Harrison Formation previously known as the Upper Phala Formation. These fossils date back to the pliant bastion stage of the early Jurassic period. While it was the second dinosaur found in Antarctica after the Antarctopelta, Cryolophosaurus was named earlier. Cryolophosaurus has and still kind of presents a challenge for classification due to its combination of primitive and advanced characteristics. Its femur exhibits traits reminiscent of early theropods, while its skull shares similarities within the Tentura clade, such as Cineraptor and Yangtuansaurus. Originally, Paul Serino et al in 1994 classified Cryolophosaurus within the taxon Allosauridae. And I won't lie, it seems that early on we'd seem to classify a lot of unknown theropods in the Allosauridae taxon for whatever reason. But there were also suspicions that Cryolophosaurus might have belonged to the Ceratosaurus or even the early Alabellosaurid groups with some features convergent with more advanced tentuans. In a more recent monograph in 2020, Cryolophosaurus was considered a derived neotheropod closely related to Aberosta, occupying a more derived position than Zupiosaurus, but less so than Dialophosaurus. These ongoing studies reflect the complexity of classifying Cryolophosaurus within the broader context of theropod evolution. And this predator being from Antarctica certainly doesn't help with discoveries. Either way, what we are confident on is that it is a theropod that was one of the earliest dominant carnivores that roamed the planet. It likely evolved its greatest size alongside its prey in order to keep up. Though admittedly, being that our knowledge is so limited on its classification itself, it's difficult to pinpoint an exact evolutionary line. As for its physical attributes, Cryolophosaurus was a large theropod dinosaur estimated to reach lengths of around 6 to 7 meters and most probably weighed around the ton range. Though I will have to say that its weight is more on the speculative side as its holotype specimen weighed between 350 to 465 kilograms, although it was noted to have not reached adulthood, instead being only in the subadult stage of its life. Though later studies carried out by Larry Mendy put this specimen at around 780 kilograms and 7.7 .7 meters in length. As for its height, let's just say it would have looked down on you. Its size made it the apex predator of Antarctica during its time. Well, as far as we know for the moment. It also had an impressive set of jaws that though wasn't tallying T-Rex levels of force, would still be effective for taking down prey, most likely exceeding the bite of the Dilophosaurus. The Krylo's arms may have also been useful for combat, possibly for holding prey still or aiding in injuring its prey. As for speed, well, this dinosaur was a bit unpopular and thanks to its holotype still being limited as well as us not really having too much research on it, there hasn't been too many studies figuring out its absolute speed. I mean, to be fair, when you're lacking trackways and fossil remains, you can't really figure out everything. But judging by its overall structure, it's highly likely that its speed and agility exceeded that of its contemporary prey items which rivaled its own size. I mean, I feel like you can't argue against that its most notable feature would have been the crest on its skull. This crest is a prominent ridge of bone that extends along the top of its skull, giving it a distinctive appearance, which has even given it the nickname, the Elvisaurus, named after, well, Elvis. The exact function of this crest is still sort of debated among scientists because when can scientists be confident in seeing eye to eye together on something, but it is generally hypothesized that it would have used its crest for display purposes, possibly being species recognition or for mating rituals. Yet this crest wasn't too durable, meaning that when it fought other organisms its own size, it was in danger of taking critical injury. It was also likely larger than most reconstructions as those are based on a subadult. Along with this, a living specimen would likely also have a larger ridge. I mean, who knows, maybe the larger headpiece were more desirable for mating. There's also a bit of debate on whether it had feathers or not, and without direct evidence we can't say for certain, although feathers would assist in retaining heat, which is especially important for smaller organisms. 
but for something like our Krylo, which was both heavy and large, it may have had limited feathering, especially considering its environment wasn't as cold as you'd imagine. Yet at the same time, it's entirely possible that they'd have complete feathering as an even larger theropod known as Eutyrannus was completely covered in feathers. Although I will have to admit that Eutyrannus' environment was quite a bit colder than what Krylophosaurus had to live in. Talking about habitat, during the early Jurassic period, Antarctica was situated close to the equator, and the global climate was notably warmer than present times. So, this meant that there was actually something around like vegetation and fully terrestrial creatures. However, the Antarctic climate wasn't like a tropical getaway. It was still characterized by cool temperatures akin to modern South Chile, with temperatures ranging between 17 to 18 degrees Celsius. Atmospheric circulation models of the Jurassic era suggest that the coastal regions likely never experienced temperature drops significantly below freezing, although more extreme climate conditions were prevalent further inland. So this might support that Krylo may have indeed had some sort of feathering, as temperatures occasionally did probably, you know, drop below freezing, so feathers would have certainly helped with that. But as for hunting, we are quite limited by the discoveries of Antarctica. I mean, there hasn't been too much found down there, but even then, we'd be lucky to find out that whatever we find down there was around during the same time as our Antarctic giant. The big boss herbivore that we are certain coexisted with our theropod was Glacialosaurus, which was an early sauropod morph. So it did have its foot in the door to be a sauropod, but it wasn't quite there yet. It measured around 6 to 7 meters in length and stood over 2 meters in height. Its weight, however, seems to be anything but concrete. Some sources have suggested lighter weights of 600 kilograms, then it just starts slowly growing from 1 ton to 3 tons to even 5 tons. Judging by reconstructions and its size, I believe due to its more robust structure compared to Krylophosaurus means that it would have reached over the ton range, if not even 2 or 3. Now, I think that since Krylophosaurus didn't necessarily have the size advantage, if they were forced to take down a healthy adult, it would mean that it would have had to rely on its speed and agility. Its serrated teeth and jaw power would be important when puncturing the skin of this sauropod morph in order to do some significant damage. It is very well possible that it would have utilized the hunting technique that included biting and holding though we would have to be careful not to fracture its fragile crest. This sort of strategy, biting, holding, and taking him down, would have likely been done to most other sauropod morphs if we are yet to discover them. Also, this predator wasn't a strict dinosaur hunter, as he seemed to have had smaller mammals on the menu. We assume this as a post-canine tooth was discovered in the stomach of a Krylophosaur. It shouldn't be surprising that a massive hunting strategy isn't required as it would have had a massive size advantage. It just had to find it and catch it. Finally, it seems very possible that Krylophosaurus may have actually been a cannibal. Some Krylophosaur bones display pathologies indicating that they were scavenged upon by other Krylophosaurs. Additionally, broken teeth from a juvenile Krylophosaur were discovered nearby. These teeth lacking roots are likely shed naturally while scavenging the carcass of an adult Krylophosaur. However, we can't really be sure if they were actively hunting each other or if they just took advantage from any food source available. Now, as far as competitors go, it seems like the only significant threat at the time that we know of would have just been another Krylophosaur. And I think you would already know what these theropods would have competed for, this being the good old classic territory resources mating partners. What else do you need? Yet, without much evidence, we can't say for sure if interspecies competition was intense or maybe just chill. If it was intense, it may explain the evidence of cannibalism discovered. Though, I wouldn't be too surprised if we end up discovering another carnivore that lived alongside Krylophosaur that was actually large enough to compete with it. Sure, there are a lot of other smaller theropods, but nothing big enough or notable enough to say that would have actively competed with our giant. So, it seems like our frozen crested lizard was living the life. Yet, extinction is still here. The extinction of Krylophosaurus, along with many other dinosaurs from the early Jurassic period in Antarctica, likely occurred amidst significant shifts in the Earth's climate. I mean, with such little understanding of its entire species existence, I'm unsure if what I'm about to say is correct, as it might have already gone extinct by this point, but hey, this is my theory. During the early Jurassic, Antarctica was positioned much closer to the equator, experiencing relatively mild temperature conditions. However, as the continent gradually drifted southward and became increasingly isolated, it underwent a transition towards cooler, temperate, and more polar conditions. This cooling trend could have had profound effects on the Antarctic ecosystems, including alterations in vegetation patterns and the availability of food sources for dinosaurs like Krylophosaurus. These environmental changes would have triggered a cascade of ecological effects impacting the entire food web. Shifts in temperature and vegetation would have likely disrupted the delicate balance between herbivore dinosaurs and their predators, leading to changes in predator-prey dynamics and increased the competition for resources. 
Ultimately, these factors combined with the inherent challenges of adapting to a changing climate may have contributed to the extinction of Crylophosaurus and other dinosaurs in Antarctica during the early Jurassic period. While I do think that temperatures play a significant role, it is important to recognize that extinction events are a complex topic which are often influenced by a combination of different types of factors. For us to know for certain what happened to it, we would need more discoveries, more research, figuring out exactly when it lived. But until then, we have to go off what we know of. And with that, we wrap up the case study for the frozen crested reptile, Crylophosaurus. Make sure you all comment below if you prefer the changes of me skipping over the titles. I think it might improve the flow of the video, but as always, I hope you all enjoyed. Don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell as it all helps a bunch. Anyways, I'll catch you on the next video. See ya.